Hi, I'm Chris and Griego with Griego Mouthpieces, and today I'm joined by Jamie Robertson, who is the Associate Professor at University of Florida. Correct. Pleasure to be here. Nice to see you, and it's great to be here in Wisconsin. Elkhorn, Wisconsin. That's where yeah. we're at. It's cold, it's wintertime, and it's a drag, but here we are. So um, I've been talking on, on this channel a lot about mouthpieces and flow and compression, throat size back bore, and through all of this, we made some discoveries with you yesterday. I wanted to talk uh, with you, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Um, about what we discovered. So uh, Jimmy had contacted me a while back about making him a mouthpiece. And um, sometimes I get busy and I'm spinning too many plates and it took me a bit to get to this, but we, we did get to it. And I started off with a scan. We started off with a, a CMM, which is a coordinate measuring machine. It has a probe, okay? And then the probe will go in and start at the throat work its way up and around the outside of the rim. And then the mouthpiece will be flipped and will go from the throat and probe all the way up. I don't know if you know this either. And it'll probe all the way up. We're probing every quarter of a millimeter through the whole back bore and around. So then we can know the, the shape of the, 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 the shank and <laughs> it'll even show the amount of wear. And like on, yeah. on your mouthpiece in particular, there was a, quite a bit of wear right. on the shank. And then there's like another taper where it was not worn because of how far it went into your original lead pipe. Right. So we start with that and then we create the, the geometry off of that, all the radi radiuses and the straights and whatnot. An interesting, interesting thing about Jimmy's mouthpiece is that after the cup where the last radius went in, the throat was about that long. I don't, I don't know if you can see that, but that, it, it was almost non-existent. From that point, the backboard started right away. And so the mouthpiece was very open, yeah. blowing. Mm -hmm. But what, what, then, so by a thought, I was like, huh, we put a standard uh, backboard in just a little bit, and we put a standard length throat in. Right. Now, can you tell me what you felt going from uh, mouthpiece to mouthpiece and what you were feeling? Wow. Well, uh, immediately when I got on the new mouthpiece, I noticed that uh, I had much more consistency of articulation. And uh, one thing that was very nice for me immediately is it gave me just sort of a, an, an ease at the contact point, like of the initiation of sound, because that's something that's been just kind of bugging me uh, uh, over quite some time. Uh, just having that ease of committing to an attack and knowing it's going to be there. And perceptually, it just made it seem like the point of attack was right here on this uh, new mouthpiece. And uh, the other thing that was really nice with uh, the new shape of the back bore is it uh, felt like it, it's giving me more even sound and a little more ease climbing into the upper register because before it was uh, the equipment I was on, it was, it was great. Um, I played it a lot in the orchestra. But I wouldn't feel so comfortable without a pie, but just having a little bit more um, maybe resistance perhaps just uh, it, there in the throat helped me uh, articulate evenly across the range right up to a high D. And so that's been a, a nice uh, money note for me to get back <laughs> to, to feel more confident there in the upper register while still not feeling like I'm compromising in my mid and low register and, or the sound isn't even tight or anything. It's still as free blowing and feels great and responds easily. But now I have that, that, those top notes back, which is nice. And that's when, when Jimmy came in, I was listening to you play and what, what I call it is um, you were right here with the compression. And, and so it would happen and, and you would, Jimmy wasn't exploring the softs, the pianismos a lot because it took X amount of energy to get that, the, the notes to respond. Right. And so by bringing in just a, a skosh in, in these areas, we were able to bring the compression right to here. And then all of a sudden the sound even cleaned up. In skosh, uh, by skosh, that, that's like a Wisconsin term, right? It I is, mean, it is a Wisconsin term, but okay. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that when people feel it, they know what's right. right. But it's hard to know until you can experience it. And 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 seeing the scan and seeing there was there were some anomalies in the back bore. It was a very uh, well made mouthpiece, but yeah. there were there was a few um, uh, in the back the previous back bore. There were a few because different reamers, multiple reamers were used to create this back bore, and I could see that in the scan. Yes. And so I was able to even those areas out, and that's what allowed us to then create a more even flow of air because we didn't have these little. Um, idiosyncrasies or areas where the two reamers met 
yeah. we were able to smooth that out and create a better flow, which created a wall of sound like this. And then as you could then deviate from the color, where before if the air is running a little too fast, you'll actually hear that the air is running faster than the sound. And so the, the, the goal is to slow that air down to the same rate as the sound, and then it becomes color. It's perceived yeah. as color rather than air, aperture, noise, yeah. whatever you want to call it. That's fascinating. And so uh, thanks for coming up. And I just wanted people to hear from uh, more of the players. I'm more of a uh, technical minded now. And so I, I want to, I mean, and I, it's perfect that you're here and we can play around with this stuff. So. It's great to be here. It's been a fun couple of days. Thanks. See you around.